So everybody, welcome to the cool room. This is the alternative off-track room, right? Okay, so my name is Dan Brown, or I'm better known as Kanban Dan for reasons I'm not going to. I'm with the LKU, so I'm in that faction, but I'm also in the Scrum Alliance faction. I'm just following on from Dan North's presentation a minute ago. So I'm in a few different factions, but I do like his idea of consistency, the way he's talking about it. And I like a good metaphor. As you may be able to tell from my belly, I do like a good chip with ketchup. So this might be an interactive session. I will point out this is the first time I've run through this particular deck in this session, so we'll uh, see how well it goes. So I'm really looking for feedback to improve it. But, so I'm relying on you lot for that, so you have a job. You've got to tell me what's good and what's bad. So, what's with all the ketchup and the sauce? Well, I know a few things as a trainer, based on things I've learned from books like this one, which is a really good book, How the Brain Learns. The worst way to learn is to have somebody like me standing at the front of a room like this, telling you stuff. Sorry. This is a conference. You're kind of going to get that, I'm afraid. So I need to trick your brains into remembering some stuff. Like this. There are many ways of doing that, but this is one of them. Ooh. So some things are hardwired into your brains. Um, I don't know, hands up, uh, who saw the presentation by David Anderson on the pre-conference keynote? Okay, that might help. Did anyone see a Horizon episode recently called How, the, How You Really Make Decisions? So if it's on iPlay, you should all watch that. I'll tell you why in a second. I think you might remember the tiger tomorrow because there's a, the system one of our brain is hardwired to remember things that are a clear and present danger to us and act on them and do some shape recognition based on that. Another way I trick people is by using learning games. But what I have found from experience at the last Kanban conference is running games at conferences is difficult. So, while they are very good for kinesthetic learners and they are good from breaking through from system one to system two thinking, they're difficult at conferences. So system one to system two thinking. This book, everyone in the world should read. It is not a Kanban book. Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for writing it. He is a neuroscientist or psychologist, and he won the, neuro the Nobel Prize for finance, for economics on this. He talked about why the crash happened and how we can avoid it again. He worked out that we have two ways of thinking. We live in what's called system two thinking, which is the bit where our mind is. It's the bit where we understand ourselves to be, but it's also really slow. And actually, most of our decisions come from system one, which is a bit more emotional, but really fast. The way I can really easily demonstrate it is, and this is a real question I'm asking you, what's two plus two? That's system one. We know this. We learned it really quickly as a kid. So it's in system one. What's 17 times 23? Welcome to lazy system two. <laughs> system two can do some really clever stuff, and this is where our reasoning is. But actually, it's really hard to get going. And now I came across a great example of this. A company I was coaching brought a new, C a new CIO. And as an agile coach, I kind of want to know what this new CIO thinks about agile, so I went and had a chat with him. He says, I don't like you agilists, you're all evangelists. I thought, that's interesting. I've been nicely bracketed there. I'm actually a scientist, but we'll move forward and not pretend on that one. And we talked about some techniques that we use and some methods. I mentioned pairing. He says, oh, I don't believe in pairing. I thought, interesting use of the word belief, given I'm the evangelist. But why don't you believe in pairing? He says, well, I've seen all the proof. I've seen all the data. I just don't believe that two people sitting around one PC can be efficient. That is system one thinking. He's seen the proof, the system two data he needs, but he can't get through the belief barrier, as I call it, and actually turn it into something he can use, because he doesn't get it in his system one. So games are really good, because it's hard to experience and do something and see your own data without actually saying, actually, this affects me now, and I'm going to start learning about it, and I'm going to care about it, and get past my system one belief barrier. So that's what I love to do. 
but not with 35-ish people. So I'm going to use metaphors today, because metaphors are also a good way to trick your brains into remembering stuff. Because while you might not remember some dry, boring slides, you might remember my little bottle of ketchup. So what got me thinking about ketchup? Well, one day I was having a plate of chips, and I noticed something. What happens if I've got a glass bottle of ketchup, and I'm an 11-year-old boy who looks almost exactly like an 11-year-old version of me, i.e. my son, and I turn the bottle upside down? What happens? Very Nothing. I get no flow. The bottle just... Am I feeling brave? <laughs> one bottle of ketchup, one jar. Nothing. Why? Well... That got me thinking. But before I go into that, let's explain what the metaphor is here. The bottle, that represents our system of work. Think of it more horizontal. The ketchup represents the work going through our system. We want the ketchup to flow out of the bottle onto our chips, right? That's the point of the ketchup bottle. It's to get ketchup from the table in some sort of hygienic manner onto our chips. So the ketchup on our plate, I didn't have chips when I was taking the photographs, <laughs> represents value. It's making us money, yeah? The ketchup on the plate is useful to us. The ketchup in the bottle is decorative. It's a bit like when you've got a Kanban board. The work in the middle doesn't really do anything for us, but it looks pretty on the wall, right? It's decorative. So that's my metaphor. So back to the... Why no flow, Joe? Oh, I'm getting brave. That was right next to my laptop and everything. <laughs> well, the bottleneck at the end gets full. And when the bottleneck's clogged up, we don't get flow. The worst place that it can happen is where it is happening, right at the point of value delivery. The thinnest part of this bottleneck is the bottleneck. <laughs> and we can't get anything through the bottleneck. The bottle is wider than the neck. I'm not stretching the metaphor too hard here, I'm hoping. <laughs> Good, I've got you with me, that's fine. So, the worst thing that can happen is we've got ketchup flowing internally from here to say here, but nothing coming out of there. In other words, we're spending work, we're moving ketchup through our system, but we're delivering no value. So we need to think about a better way of doing this. So I'm trying to make you visualise the work you're doing in your office and think about what your ketchup bottle looks like. So I've got some more examples. But first of all, I want to think about the teachings. I'm going to get right in early. That's, you know, within 10 minutes, we're getting to the key learnings that go on big slides. Everything I ever say seems to be either blatantly logical, common sense, or completely counterintuitive, but when you think about it in system two, common sense. So I'm, I'm hoping I'm not patronizing you here by telling you that. Any work you're doing inside your system is completely fruitless until it gets to the point where value is delivered. I like to call the work in the middle of our Kanban board, in the middle of our system, our liability. We're spending money on it, and it's usually quite a lot of money, but we're not delivering anything of value yet. It's only when it gets to the end it becomes valuable. If it's rejected or stopped at any point before the value is delivered, then it becomes pointless. How many times have we heard about two or three year or five year or 10 year government projects or other projects, big IT projects, that get canned just before they go live or a year before they go live? None of the work produced any value because nothing went live. So we need to not have this stuff lying around. Next big slide. If you are thinking about a Kanban board, and I mean this in a very basic sense of to do, doing, and done. And in doing, you might have, I don't know, analysis, dev, and QA, just to pick up a simple example of a Kanban build. It's only the QA phase or the deployment phase that delivers any value. There is no value in doing development work in that particular model. The value comes at the end when the development work has passed QA, if that's the last column, and gone live. That makes sense to everybody? So, we need to think about that when we're doing work. 
it doesn't matter how much dev work we're doing. That's how wide the bottle is. The last column's the bottleneck. That's the bit that matters. Has anyone here played the game Get Kanban, the board game? It's three hours of your life that's really well spent. In actual fact, the second time's even better when you've got all the spoilers and you know what's going to come and it still kicks you in the proverbials. And it still kicks you in the proverbials because this happens. That's not a big spoiler. There is a bottleneck at the end of the system. And the worst place you can ever get a bottleneck is at the end of your system because that means we're doing lots and cramming more and more into the bottleneck. The bottleneck will never resolve because there's always more work coming into it than it can happen, than it can happily deal with. Demand is exceeding capacity. Classic example of this is I turned up at a company and they said, why is that task blocked? We've done the dev work, but we need Sophie from such and such a team. She only needs to do a 15-minute code review, but she's not available because she's in a different scrum team and she can't work on external things that are distractions. I'm not looking in that direction because it's not the company that that guy's from at all. But it was a year ago, it's fine. But that actually was what I told us. Well, how likely is it, and I'm a former developer, so I've got a bit of experience in this. How likely is it when Sophie looks at this, given she's the only expert in the entire company on that bit of code base, that she's going to approve it first time? Would you say, yeah, that's good, versus actually, that's a lot of rubbish. Can we redo it from start, please? And I know the second option is a lot more likely because I've been there and done that a few times, and it hurts. So the obvious solution to that is, why did we do that work? Why didn't we just line Sophie up and not start the work until she was available, then pair with her on it, and guess what? Now we've got two people who understand a bit about that code base, some shared learning, and it gets done as quickly as it possibly can do. And it's not clogging up our borders blocked forever eating a bit more of our very precious bottleneck. Okay, I'm going to go back to some small text slides now. But there are some big learnings I want you to think about. So how can we apply the learning? Well, we can focus on finishing work. It sounds really obvious again. I feel like I'm patronizing everyone in the room. Hopefully I'm not. But only the ketchup on the plate matters. The, the ketchup that moves from there to there is irrelevant. This ketchup moving from there to there doesn't help me. It's only when it comes out of the bottle that it's valuable. So we should be focusing on getting the ketchup on the plate. We should be focusing on releasing work. Not doing work, finishing work. We should only work on things that do have a clear path to completion. There are enough things, and I think we all know this, that will go wrong on a piece of work that mean it will get blocked or have an impediment in flight anywhere, that we don't start something that we know will block or have an impediment before we even start. We line stuff up. We make sure we clear those impediments. We talk to other people. We collaborate. And we make sure that the point of committing to a piece of work, it's got the best possible chance of getting right the way through. You can't ever do that 100%, but it's those known problems that you're trying to deal with. You can't deal with the unknown problems, but you can deal with the known problems before you commit to the work. If you haven't read the book Commitment, by the way, which was mentioned earlier, Chris Matt and other people, um, about real options, two of the people who are characters in that are actually speaking here today. John Terry and Liz Keogh are here. So it's kind of interesting to see real people in a book. It's written as a graphic novel, which put me off for years. It's, you know, it's a comic book, but it's a really good thing to understand real options and why we want to defer commitment two options as late as possible. This is what I'm talking about. Defer commitment to things until you know they can complete, or they, they know they've got the best possible chance of completion. Finish the things you already have started before you start new things. Hopefully in a Kanban conference you will get that. But that's a fundamental. There's no point in moving ketchup down from this part of the bottle to this part of the bottle to the bit that's at the bottleneck, has cleared. I keep getting nervous. Every time I pick it up, it slides a bit further down. Have you know what? The viscosity is changing. I love this phrase, and I've stolen it and plagiarized it like an artist, straight from XP. But I use it in a slightly different way. Bring the pain forward. 
the only acceptable place for a bottleneck in your system is at the beginning, not the end. That sounds weird. We should restrict the work coming into our system so that the work coming out of our system can flow as quickly as possible. The alternative sounds more like the traditional management. We get the work started. We get the sooner you start, the sooner you finish, that whole thing, which is, by the way, ridiculous. That sounds like a causal loop, you know, the cause and effect. Starting something causes something to finish. That's not true. It's impossible to finish without starting. That's true, I'll give you that. But starting something does not mean that it will later finish. It just means that it has been started. The only way to finish something is to finish it. Finish it, the verb. So the sooner you finish, the sooner you finish. It's a much better way of thinking about the world. So if you do it the other way around, if you've got your bottleneck at the end of the system rather than the beginning of the system, you'll pump more and more work in. The bottleneck will always be constrained. It will always have contention. You'll always have pressure points there. And I think Dan North mentioned this beautifully. If you get to 100% utilization of this bottleneck, that's when you're doing that. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I started sideways. Nobody had a plan for that. Do we have any napkins? He said to somebody in a red t-shirt nicely. <laughs> this is why we have a pot, though. You'll remember that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, bring the pain forward. Thank you. I'll steal one for my fingers, if nothing else, because I don't want it on my laptop. I don't care about the carpet here. I'm not extremely embarrassed at the moment at all in covering for myself. Oops, it's still working. Thank you, I'll, I'll get that afterwards. <laughs> no, but you can get the floor later. Now my, my trick's going to be standing it and tread it in as wide an area as possible. Okay, so bring the pain forward. So, whip limits. This is why we're limiting whip. It isn't to stop multitasking. It is to bring the pain forward. That doesn't mean we eliminate pain. It means we take the pain at the acceptable point before commitment. We say to somebody who's a stakeholder, no, sorry, which one of these is more important? Because we can't do all those things at once. We can only do the first one of those things, or these two things. We can't do all three or four or five. It's much better than starting all four or five and then not delivering anything, or delivering one thing very slowly. Bring that pain forward so we can make business decisions and choices based on the options while they are still options and not commitments. Let me show you what I mean. So I had some fun with bottles of ketchup at home, and I didn't do that once, can you believe it? But this is my artisanal gift bottle, available at a farm shop near you, with some interesting ketchup in it. It is typified by its very wide body and a long, very thin neck. That's what I found out about this one, ketchup it's very difficult to make flow out of a bottle like that. Why? Well, the, the wide body and the thin neck, it speaks for itself. As soon as you get to an optimum angle, you actually create a bottleneck here. And that means nothing flows. So you actually have to have a, such a slow flow rate that very little comes out. OK, that's great if you're a ketchup aficionado, but let's talk about that at work. We've got lots of work going on, but very few releases to live. Does that sound familiar to people? Certainly sounds familiar to organizations I've worked with, and this is what I've seen happens. If you tell a bunch of stakeholders you're getting 10 releases this year, they go, oh, that's interesting. I want all this in the first release, all this in the second release, and so on. Everything they ask for is huge. And then if you want a little change, like, oh, can we just move that button from there to there? Because we've seen a 600% uplift in sales if we move a button from there to there on the page which actually happened to one of my clients. Those small changes get bundled into the big changes. These are very risky things. And because they're very big and get bundled up, big releases become even more painful. You have to have more and more work going into that release to get it right. And there's more and more risk bundled up with it. So releases become even less frequent. You thought you could do 10, but you only get eight out, which means <laughs> go to line one. The stakeholders ask for even more in their releases because they're getting even less releases. And you end in that vicious cycle of things just getting bigger and more difficult and bigger and more difficult. 
That's what this encourages. And I've often seen this actually presented as a double funnel. So if you imagine that bottle back to back with it, work coming into the IT team, and then on the other side, work coming out of the IT team. And in the middle bit, it's where we've got like 25 scrum teams doing lots and lots of work, but very little coming out to production. So, a better way. I'm going to call this the carafe bottle, which is typified by a very wide neck, but actually not that wide a bottle itself. It's a bit more useful than one of these, even with the blob of ketchup, which I'll leave forward so you can, or slightly sideways so you can photograph. But it's narrow in the body, but fairly wide at the neck. I would not have done any of the turning upside down experiments with that bottle, because I tried them at home. Remember that big that plate full of ketchup I had earlier? It came from this bottle, because flow is encouraged by the wide bottleneck. It takes a heck of an amount of flow rate to clog that bottleneck up, because the bottleneck isn't much narrower than the actual amount of work that's going on. So, ketchup flows at near optimum rate. So how does that look? Well, we're working on less things at once. We're limiting our work in progress. I should have mentioned tribal language gets me all the time. Whip is work in progress. So we limit our whip, we limit our work in progress. And by working on less things, there's more emphasis on finishing the things we're already working on. Not working on them, finishing them. Which means that more work gets completed. That is a natural result. Ketchup comes out quicker from a wide neck bottle than a narrow back bottle. Therefore, you get more ketchup on your plate in less time. The time taken from the ketchup to flow from the, bottle of the bo bottom of the bottle out of the bottle to the plate is less. Work travels across our system more quickly. We do things faster. Most companies like that. We've all gone quiet and thoughtful now. Ever since I dropped the ketchup, it's terrible. <laughs> Feedback comes earlier, guiding future work. Anyone here from um, lastminute.com? Good. So I went and did a talk at lastminute.com, <laughs> and they told me all about this wonderful idea they had. So they have a restaurant search. And on their restaurant search page, what they have noticed is most of the traffic does restaurant searches in London. Who'd have thought it? So what they thought was, we've got an idea. Let's reduce the number of clicks for our users to get to something useful by actually taking away the search page and just presenting all the London restaurants with a search box on the side. That's good, right? Small piece of work, because it just means you just basically parameterize your search with a bit of query string, and that's your homepage now. Traffic dropped off like you would not believe. I mean, like 90% drop off. Why? Well, the page load time was huge. They were returning every single restaurant in London in a long list on the homepage. That's a really bad idea. So they rolled it back the next day. So we're talking about a small piece of work that got through our system very quickly, probably less than a week, you would have thought. Went live quickly. Feedback was sought that, you know, probe sense respond or plan do check out. They thought they'd get better traffic. They thought they'd get um, faster click through. Turns out they didn't. So they changed back very quickly. That's easy if you're just doing that small release. But what if that's been tied into the whole new look and feel of the site that you've been working on for two years with the wonderful new hotel system that you've put in? You have to roll it all back on none of it because you did a big bundled release. Dangerous. Small release, simple, less risky. Going live becomes an option rather than a commitment because rolling back is simple. You waste less effort working on the wrong thing. Because you're live quicker, you get the feedback quicker. Because you get the feedback quicker, you can work out if you're heading the right direction. You're not spending two years going over there when actually you kind of wanted to go that way. Small work is encouraged. If you're always going back to the stakeholder saying, can you give me more, can you give me more, what do you want next, what do you want live in the next 17 days, that's a great thing to be asking stakeholders, isn't it? And if you don't think you can do frequent releases, if you, for example, were an online retailer and you think you're doing something more complicated than Amazon is, that's an interesting thought. Amazon release, on average, do you know how often? It's one of my favorite stats. 
on average, they release 1,500 times per day. Think how many releases that is a year. Because they're doing small iterative releases, they don't have these big burdens of like trainings, how to use the thing. When's the last time you got trained how to use a wish list on Amazon? I mean, that didn't start off with the all singing, all dancing version they've got now with multiple lists, and private and public, and add things from non-Amazon -web websites and so on. It started off as a really simple little thing and evolved because they could ask for small things and get them live quickly without impacting other things and with redu reduced risk. So ultimate ketchup, I thought, carafe's good. What would be better? Well, I got one of my whiskey glasses. These have a smaller body than neck. They are wider at the top than the bottom. They are sort of conical. So if you turn one of these babies upside down, you really do get a big mess on the floor. Um, <laughs> the neck can never clog up, which means, whoa, that I can't drive one of these things. Once things start, they finish as quickly as it's possible to start because you've always got demand at the point of release, pulling things through. Give me more, give me more. I've got Slack, give me more. But Slack's a good thing. I'm not going to go into it too much, but it typically will lead to resilience. And if you want to look at the work of Stephen Parry, you'll see in his books, you'll see more about that. But uh, he did a really good talk at the last Kanban, LKU Kanban conference in November last year, which will be a really good event again this year. That's the only plug I'm doing, so it's all good. Well, actually, I say that, it's not. <laughs> and I thought, let's look at a real example. Where is he? Yes, the, uh, the POM bottle that got used. Sorry. I was advised, I was looking for a wobbly bottle, and I couldn't find one. I was advised by my colleague over there to look at the POM bottle, which is pomegranate juice. This bottle has wide bits and narrow bits, wide bits and narrow bits. What do you think that's due to in a real world example? or whip limits. That's our whip limits. We've got wide whip, narrow whip, wide whip, narrow whip, wide whip, narrow whip. But the maximum flow out of the bottle is still determined by this one. This bottleneck is still smaller than everything else. So that's just before go live, actually. It's slightly narrower just before go live than going live. So what does that teach us about whip limits? No. <laughs> They have to hurt you to be effective. If your whip limits are not bringing the pain forward, they're leaving the pain at the end. So if you've got a whip limit and you're not touching the whip limit, you haven't got a whip limit. It just looks like you've got a number on your board. A whip limit, a number which is a maximum of items in a particular column on your board, only works if it pinches. And if it pinches smaller at some point than the pinch at the end, to bring the pinch forward. Because if you've got a bottleneck in the middle of your system, you can't have the bottleneck at the end, you end up in a whiskey bottle scenario. And whiskey bottle scenarios are good. We want whiskey, bottle, whiskey glasses, I should say. So the whip limits themselves must become the bottleneck. And where's the best place to have the bottleneck? Hey, that's reflected learning. See, that, that book I bought at the beginning really helps, doesn't it? Because you lot said it rather than me, that's better learning than me telling you. So, I took ages over that with a bit of Photoshop. Nice t-shirt though, right? Because I'm going to wear this so many times again. If you've got a bottleneck at the end of your system, the whip limits to the left, the upstream whip limits, are only going to stop your team going, those are the columns going from starvation. I've got nothing to do mode. I'm idle. But they don't actually help. Giving those people busy work, more to work on because they're idle, is actually a stupid thing. So you've got really expensive people with really expensive skill sets, and I'm telling you that giving them more work to do is a really bad idea. It's really going to hurt you if you do. Why? Because anything you, you don't do that doesn't work on that bottleneck is making the problem worse, not better. Because the bottleneck will never clear. You might clear what's in it now, but it's just going to be full up with all of that busy work that you did previously. So actually, getting these guys from the upstream, from the left of your board, to focus on the bottleneck at the right-hand side is how you get into a whiskey glass scenario. That's what we should be doing, even if it means local inefficiency. Analysts aren't good testers. 
Devs here don't do testing because testing is a specialist skill, not writing tests, so really specialist skill. Running through a test script or pressing go on a machine and watching the results is fairly generalist. Anyone can do that. Might not be the best use of those people's individual efficiency, but the system, the bit that's getting the ketchup onto the players, is much more efficient. And that's what matters. It isn't how busy and how entertained your workers are that really matters. It's how much value your system delivers. That's what matters. That's the money maker. You know, the survival agenda. We can actually survive as a company if it's making money. So, what do you do if you're already in the doo-doo? I didn't know what kind of audience it was. I didn't want to swear. So, do you pat the bottom? I call that pushing work. Push work through the system. Well, is anyone here wearing a white shirt that fancies coming and patting the bottom of my red ketchup bottle? I assume no responsibility for the state of the carpet afterwards, apparently. When you push through a system with a bottleneck, things will get messy. Just, they do. That's exactly what happens with the ketchup bottle. Splat, 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 pff, oh dear. Um, Dave here will tell you about a time he used ketchup first. <laughs> Uh, one of his meetups, and someone exploded. Uh, the ball exploded onto everybody, and including someone in a white shirt, which is always guaranteed, by the way. I'm surprised no one in white wasn't sitting just here when I did it. So, what are the alternatives? Back to the floor. What, is it, if we're not going to smack the bottle of ketchup, we want to get ketchup out. What we're going to do instead? Sorry. That's fairly drastic. You might end up with glass in there. A pull system. What would that look like with ketchup in, in a bottle? Stick a knife in the end. Sorry, eventually, it's, it's like being you, you know, one of those ast astrologers. Eventually, you're going to get the right answer from the audience, and you just go, did you have a relative with it? Yes, we stick a knife at the end. And it is a pull system. Yes, but pull isn't as good as flow. Flow is better. If we can have flow, then we're in happy land. Pull is better than flow. This is straight from Stephen Perry, or at least the top bit is. Flow if you can, pull if you must. And I put in the button, never push unless you want a mess on the carpet. So I want to introduce you a new metaphor very quickly. This has gone a lot longer than I did than when I practiced by myself. Who'd have thought? New talks always do. This is a road, believe it or not, under all those cars. And the cars on this road and this junction are meant to flow, are they not? That's what, what traffic management's all about. It's all about flow. But some conjunctions are highly contended. We're in London right now. We know this to be true. So what do they do when they have a junction which is highly contended and flow can't have? And you've got more demand than the capacity ha permits. What happens? What do we do? Anybody drive? <sighs> That's one thing. But if, you, if you're going to have traffic coming to that junction, whatever, what you do is yellow cross-hatch junction congestion charge is an interesting one. That's limiting your demand to match your capacity, by the way, which is really another one of my metaphors. I'm leaving that one over there. Coming back to the yellow cross-hatch junction. Now, most people who've got their driving test and haven't done their theory for a long, 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 long time won't know what that means. So I want to tell you what the rules are. The law says, if you ignore turning right, we'll leave that to one side, the straight on at the box junction says, you must not enter, not you should not, you must not, in other words, it's illegal to, enter the box until your exit road or lane is clear. What that means is we have a pull system because the space at the far side is your trigger, your pull card, your Kanban card, if you like, pulling you into the junction and pulling you through it. You shouldn't stop on it. So think of your work in progress boards, by the way, your Kanban boards, like yellow cross hatch junctions. You don't want things to stop on it. They keep moving through. You're flowing across the board. You don't want those blockers in the middle. Pull system. And it's a pull system because we have a lack of flow. If pull systems were better, every part of the road in the world would be yellow cross-hatched, and it isn't. We only do it at great expense, and it's expensive to police it, expensive to make it. We only do it where we have to. Same with pull systems in our, our work. We should be implementing these pull systems through our teams and then relaxing them as flow happens. And if flow causes bottlenecks, we should then implement pull systems. What happens if you push through this pull system? Well, 
you get fined if the 12 police. If you're not, that happens. This is gridlock. Every direction of travel is blocked by people trying to go in the opposite direction of travel, or, or 90 degrees. Because people have finally entered the yellow crosshatch junction, this guy has to get out of his car and go, what on earth am I meant to do? My wife's in the middle of giving birth. So, we don't push through a pull system. We pull. We've got a contended system. So, takeaways. It's about the ketchup on the plate, not the ketchup in the bottle. We shape the bottle to optimize the flow of ketchup onto the plate. Because it's only ketchup on the plate that makes us money. It's the value out of the system, not the work in progress. Not what we're working on, the value out. That's where the business lies. Everything upstream of the delivery column is there to keep the delivery column with just enough work to optimize flow out of delivery. 140 characters, if anyone's fancying tweeting. I'm <laughs> guessing not. It flows off the tongue. But that's the thing. The last column is the one that delivers value. All of the columns and all of the whip limits to the left are there to make sure exactly the right amount of work is flowing into that last column. Not too much, not too little. No bottleneck, no starvation. And that's how we get the ketchup on the plate. By the way, that's my bullet point. I was quite pleased with those. That was my wife's idea. <laughs> if you want to hear more, can I suggest that you might want to come to the Kanban Coaching Exchange, which is free in London and happens monthly. You can find it on Meetup. If you tap me up later, I've got some business cards for it. This is a photograph recently taken at it. And some of you are on it. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> And I counted 46 people and one porcelain horse on that. Um, it's hosted for us by uh, Pearson Publishing. No, Macmillan Publishing. Let's get that one right. Macmillan Publishing. Um, we also offer training through Ripple Rock. And there's a little thing in your handout today that'll tell you all about that. And you can go and find us. Um, and I'll be at the open space and the coaching clinic later today if you have any more questions. Because I've horribly overrun. And we had the two minute sign about a minute and a half ago. So I'm going to click. That button, and hope that there aren't many, but no. Please do ask questions. I've got a question. Is anyone going to be able to help me with the ketchup? <laughs> Does anyone want a bottle of ketchup? <laughs> okay, thank you for your time.